Hi there. Welcome to the second episode of Stories That Made Us, the weekly podcast where we look at stories that define humanity. In the first series, we learn about the creation myths of various cultures, and today we will be talking about the civilization that gave us arguably the largest medieval city of the world, the Nochtitlan, which, under its new name of Mexico City, continues to thrive and flourish as one of the largest in North America. The people of this wondrous civilization were master farmers, adding avocados, chipotle, tomatoes, and chocolate to our diet. We are, of course, talking about the Aztecs. Today's entire focus will be on the Aztec beliefs of the origin of the world and the gods that created it. Now, for a long time, there was nothing. No light, no life, and no consciousness. There was no time just emptiness. And out of this emptiness arose Ometeotl, the oldest of gods, the primordial deity and the personification of duality. While the god was one, its nature was both masculine and feminine. This is the reason why Ometeotl arose out of nothing creating itself with no father or mother, because Ometeotl, as an embodiment of both, could bear life alone. The Supreme God, in this dual form of Omesihuatl, the female, and Ometekutli, the male, became the creator of life. Through the deity spawned four sons, Tezcatlipoca, Shipetotec, Quetzalcoatl, and Huitzilopochtli. These four venerated gods were then tasked to create our world. They were ordained to protect and preserve nature and life. The gods have forever served as the guardians of humanity administering rewards and punishments as they seem fit. Once the gods were born into this nothingness, they existed in the void for 600 years. It was only after this that creation began in earnest. They first created the essence of water which encompassed the entire universe. Then came the crocodile serpent, Sipatli. He swam in this all-pervading water as the only life in the universe. Now, as gods continued to create, they landed on a massive problem. Everything that they had created would fall into the water and be eaten by Sipatli. No amount of persuasion would stop Sipakli from swallowing worlds into its belly. Unable to convince the serpent from abstaining from his rambunctious hunger, the exasperated gods Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca attacked the crocodile serpent. Sipakli, however, was more than a match for the two gods and thus ensued a great battle. Unable to beat the giant serpent in a straight fight, the two gods then used cunning to devise a plan. Tezcatlipoca sacrificed his foot, which was used as a bait to lure Sipatli. The moment the hungry serpent let down its guard to sate its insatiable hunger, the gods pounced on him from either side, thus decimating the creature, 
severing and stretching its body in all four directions. The other gods were aghast at this violence. They refused to work with Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca on further creation until the two atoned for their actions. After much debate and deliberation, it was accepted that creation would go forth, with Zipatli's body being used as the source of all beauty in the world. It was thus decided that her hair would birth huge trees and beautiful shrubberies. Water would spring forth from the late serpent's eyes, with rivers issuing from its mouth. From its shoulders, majestic mountains and hills were fashioned. It was in Sipatli's body that the gods gave form to our world. They created thirteen heavens in Sipatli's head, the earth in the middle, and nine underworlds in its tail. The earth is nothing but a disk located in the middle of Sipatli's monstrous body, surrounded by celestial waters. Then came the division of the universe into four great quadrants. At the very center is the navel. It is from here that Ometeotl, the supreme deity, sends forth the energy that sustains the entire universe. From here, the god controls the cosmos and formulates the laws of nature that govern all. It is here that the primordial deity both creates and destroys and generates the sacred movements and waves in the great space-time continuum. From here, the god imparts the energy of life to the world. At the end of the earth, where the sun sets, is the west. This is the sun's home and is the realm of Quetzalcoatl. He is the keeper of wisdom and all things related to irrigation and plantations. This realm is the land of experience, wisdom, fertility and life. The opposite end is the east and this is the land of Shipetotec. Nothing exists here for this is the land of perils and danger. This realm is dominated by the dawn and spring, the dawn signifying the rebirth of each day, while spring embodies the rebirth of nature each year. The south is the land of Huitzilopochtli, the deity of war and sacrifice. Finally, the north is the sacred place of Tezcatlipoca, the lord of the night sky. This realm is associated with the underworld, Mictlan, which is under the reign of Mictecasihuatl and Mictlantecutli, the lady and the lord of darkness. This is the bitter cold and lifeless land of the dead. Thus, having set the building blocks of creation in place, the gods now focused on bringing life upon earth. They realized soon enough that to spur life, a great source of energy was essential. They needed the sun. However, Creating one was beyond their means. The sun was so powerful that the only way it could come to be was through the sacrifice of a powerful god. Tezcatlipoca was chosen among and by the gods to be the first sun.
His realm was called the Son of Earth, and he was portrayed as the Great Jaguar. Through his mighty power, the first men came forth, but they were all giants. They were so strong that they could uproot trees and hurl boulders with their bare hands. It is in this age that the four gods also gave life to other gods, the most important of whom were Tlaloc, the god of rain and fertility, and Chalchiwitlikwe, the goddess of lakes, rivers and oceans. All was good in the world, but the light of the sun was dim. For Tezcatlipoca was maimed during the war with Zipatli. This handicap meant that he was not as bright as the sun we see today. Tezcatlipoca, the first sun, was called the half sun. In the meantime, Quetzalcoatl was growing irritated and impatient with his brother's deficiency and the implied lack of creation. Having fought Sipatli beside Tezcatlipoca and with much to offer to the world as creator, he thought to be the sun himself and ruled the world he helped create. Thus ensued the battle of the siblings. Amid the fight, Quetzalcoatl hurled a huge boulder at Tezcatlipoca, flinging him down from the heaven, thus dethroning the sun. This cast the world in darkness, and an angry Tezcatlipoca, not to be outdone, turned into a jaguar and devoured the world and all its inhabitants thus decimating his own creation to nothingness. This brought the end to the age of the first sun. This age lasted for 676 years, and it was called the age of the four jaguars. Quetzalcoatl, after defeating his brother, took over the mantle of the next sun unopposed. The plumed serpent god oversaw an age when the gods created humans like us, unlike the giants of the previous age. The humans lived happily in the great woods, hunting and foraging. All was good, but alas, this the age of the second sun, very much like the age of the first sun, was not to last. Jealous of his brother's creation and still angry at being dethroned, Tezcatlipoca spread venom in the hearts of men, who demurred from worshipping their creators. Quetzalcoatl, however, still loved his subjects. People became evil, killing and maiming one another for land and pleasure. But Quetzalcoatl was unmoved. He cared too deeply to destroy his world. Frustrated, Tezcatlipoca then used magic to turn all mankind to monkeys. This finally annoyed Quetzalcoatl. He was determined to start life anew, and thus he sent forth hurricanes that swept the monkeys and all else on the earth away, leaving behind a clean slate that was ready for a new age. Thus ended the age of the second sun. It lasted for 364 years and is known as the Age of the Sun of Winds. Then came the Age of the Third Sun. Tlaloc, the god of rain, ruled over this creation. 
a new race of humans was created. And as ever, all was good. This age was good, for the sun provided for his people, teaching them farming and providing water for fertilizing crops. Tezcatlipoca, however, was still upset at being dethroned and having to watch creation from the sidelines. He still sought revenge for the loss of his reign. The vengeful god somehow managed to seduce Tlaloc's wife, who left the sun god to be with Tezcatlipoca. Tlaloc was grief-stricken and angry. In his anger, he shone upon the world with great intensity. He refused to listen to his people and answer their prayers. He did not send rain to cool the world. Thus, crops died and people suffered due to hunger and drought. The people cried and prayed to the god for deliverance and relief. But Tlaloc, in his anger and grief, was unmoved. When the people prayed for rain, Tlaloc sent rain a rain of fire. He rained fire down from the heaven and scorched the world. Volcanoes erupted from the earth, devastating all in its path. He scorched the world, leaving it void of any and every living thing, and then retired from being the third sun. This ended the age of the third sun. After this devastation, the goddess Chalchiwitlikwe was appointed as the fourth sun. Of all the suns, it was the fourth that loved humanity the most, always listening and providing for its needs. Tezcatlipoca, however, was still dissatisfied. Bent on destroying all creation, he now played on the poor sun goddess's fears. He said to her that people did not believe her to be as exalted as the four sons of Ometeoto. He convinced the goddess that nobody believed that she truly loved her creation, that her reign was just an act all to gain fame and acceptance. The poor goddess listened to these accusations and was overcome with sadness. She wept and wept for 52 years, during which her tears sent water pouring all over the creation, thus destroying the world in a great flood. The heavens crashed down upon the earth as her short reign ended in a disaster for all. This destruction marked the end of the age of the fourth sun. Now, before the age of the fifth sun began, the gods decided that things must be done differently. They realized that the best way to create the most desirable version of mankind would be to go to the underworld and to retrieve the bones of our ancestors. For bones are like seeds. Everything that dies goes into the earth, and from it, new life begins in the sacred cycle of existence. Quetzalcoatl was chosen for this task, and so he journeyed to the ninth lair of the underworld, guided by Shalotl, the evening star. Once there, he sought an audience with Mictecasihuatl and Mictlantecutli, the rulers of the land of the dead. He asked the lord and the lady of the underworld for permission to take the bones of man's ancestors. 
explaining to them the need to restart creation. Miklan Tekutli, however, was unimpressed, for he saw this as a plot to reduce his powers. If gods could just pick and choose anything they wish, our significance as rulers of the dead would diminish, he argued. Miktekasihuatl, his wife, further stated that if gods of heaven picked everything from their realm, there would be nothing left to rule. They would be the lord and the lady of nothing. Quetzalcoatl, however, was a powerful god and was not to be denied. Everything in this realm is rightfully ours, spoke Miklan Tekutli. If you are to take something that is ours, you are to let the entire realm know that it was us who granted you permission. You may take the bones of man, but in return, you shall have to travel to the underworld four times, sounding the shell horn and garnering attention of all. Then, you are to extol my and Mittekasihuatl's virtues for agreeing to your requests. Quetzalcoatl had no choice but to defer to the rulers of the realm. I accept your demands, good lord, he said. However, I do not possess a shell horn. Do provide me with one, and your wish shall be done. Miklan Tekutli then gave Quetzalcoatl the horn. But alas, it had no holes for the wind to blow. The scheming lord of Underworld smirked as Quetzalcoatl inspected the item and left the god to deal with this problem alone. After much thought, Quetzalcoatl drilled holes into the shell by using worms and other gnawing insects, ordering them to chew holes into the conch shell. He then took the horn, held it up, and summoned bees to swarm inside through the holes and buzz loudly. Their sound echoed through the shadowy realm as a trumpet blast. Quetzalcoatl then travelled through the realms of hell four times as was told. Finally, having completed the task, he then proceeded to collect the bones and head back to Earth. The Lord of Miklan, however, had a change of heart. Though he had given his word to Quetzalcoatl, he demurred at the last moment, trying his best to keep the bones in the underworld. The blue-plumed serpent god, however, was not to be deterred and managed to escape from all the traps and distractions. Eventually, he came out of the underworld with the bones. He did, however, drop some of them on his way to heaven, shattering them into different shapes and sizes. Eventually, Quetzalcoatl took these bones to Tamoakan, one of the realms in heaven, and handed them to Sihuacuato, the serpent woman. She ground the bones into a paste and put them in a sacred jar. She then asked the gods to convene and pour their sacred blood over the bones. This is how our first ancestors in the age of the fifth sun our age came to be. Now, with all aspects of creation in place, the final act was to appoint a sun god to dominate the new age.
all the deities gathered together in heaven to now choose the one who would be sacrificed to create the fifth sun. Tecusistecatl, a haughty and boastful god with much pride in his strength and appearance, first volunteered to be sacrificed. This was, for him, a chance to increase his stature. A second god, Nanahuatzin, a more humble but diseased deity, disfigured severely by acne, also volunteered. The gods, of course, preferred Tecusistecatl, for they believed that a handsome and strong god could only yield a radiant and resplendent sun. The vain god, dressed up in beautiful jewel-encrusted robes, and prepared himself by making offerings of remarkable treasures to the gods. After the grand ceremony, when the time came for sacrifice, Tecusistecatl panicked and hesitated to end his life. He tried to summon his courage and step into the sacrificial fire, but to no avail. Four times he tried, and four times he failed. Seeing this, Nanahuatzin, the diseased but humble god, stepped forward and without a word, but with steely resolve in his eyes, jumped into the fire, thus sacrificing himself. The other gods were amazed at the spirit and courage of Nanahuatzin, the one whom they had previously discarded as a weak god. This hurt the pride of Tecusistecatl, who, like a wounded animal, leapt into the sacrificial fire following Nanahuatzin. Now, this was not meant to be. The gods were meant to sacrifice only one for the sun, but two had jumped in the sacrificial fire. All the deities waited with bated breath for the result of this boshed sacrifice. This had never been done before. After much waiting, they spied Nanahuatzin rise in the sky. And he was a worthy son, reborn as Tonatiu, the blazing sun god. He was wrapped in beauty and splendor and shone brightly. The jubilations, however, were soon cut short, because soon after the emergence of Nanahuatzin as Tonatiu, Tecusistecatl also rose to the sky. The world now had two suns, both shining brightly, too brightly for the world. The gods now found themselves in a dilemma, for they did not know how to handle this mess. After much debate, it was decided that Tonatiu was to be the sun, the one to shine brightly each day as a sign of his courage and a lesson to the world that with inner strength, the most underrated and unexpected people can shine forth as bright as the god. The question then, was how to reduce the glare of the other sun, of Tecusistecatl's brightness. One of the gods threw a rabbit at this second sun, which dimmed its light, turning the sun to the moon. One can still see the pockmarks on the moon where the rabbit hit the celestial deity. This is why the Aztecs say that during the full moon, a rabbit is in the moon's light. Now, Tonatiu, the new sun god of the fifth age, did not take kindly to the gods, who, 
in his previous incarnation mocked him for his disease, calling him weak and pathetic. He refused to move in the sky and along the surface of the earth without blood sacrifices from the rest of the gods. This was an immediate problem, for without movement there would be no night, and the world would burn under the constant heat and light radiating from the sun. Without night, creation could not begin. Seeing this, and not wishing to sacrifice himself, Tlahuis Kalpantekutli, the god of the planet Venus, the morning star, threw a dart at Tonatiu, which the sun god promptly threw back, hitting Tlahuis Kalpantekutli on the forehead and transforming him immediately into a stone. In his new avatar, Tlahuis Kalpantekutli became the god of ice and cold. The rest of the gods understood and conceded that the only way forward would be to agree to the blood sacrifice. It was thus decided that Quetzalcoatl would administer this deed as the priest to the sun god. The deities then bared their chest and stepped into the sacrificial altar, where Quetzalcoatl removed their hearts with a knife. Now, Tlauis Kalpantekutli, the evening star, still seeks revenge for Tonatiu's attack, and every 584 days he rises from the eastern sea to do battle with Tonatiu once again. The sun god survives through the strength that mankind provides through sacrifices, so that he could feast on our hearts and gain nourishment, just as he had first been nourished by the hearts of the gods. Tonatiu is also swallowed each night by the earth goddess Tlaltecutli and is then regurgitated the following morning. Human sacrifices ensure his successful return. This then is the Aztec story of creation. But there is one more little tale to discuss before we conclude the episode. The tale of life after death. Now, the Aztecs reserve the highest blessings for warriors who die in battle. This is followed by those who gave their lives to gods in the sacrificial altars. Their souls, the Aztecs believe, enter Tonatiuhican, the house of the sun. These warriors and martyrs accompany Tonatiu on his passage each day from east to west. They are lavished with all kinds of luxuries of the heavens and the world. They are fed with sumptuous food and delectable wine. All men and women desire to be in this realm in the afterlife, so much so that they prefer to be willing sacrifices to the gods. After four years, they return back to earth as hummingbirds and other exotic birds and animals. The women who die of childbirth, unfortunately, go to the realm of Senalka. They are deemed to be female warriors, though they return to earth each night as frightful phantoms and ghosts that steal children. They cause seizures and bring about insanity to all who chance upon them. These phantoms are depicted as having clawed hands and feet and sharp fangs. Now, those men and women who drown, die of lightning 
or lose their life to accidents related to water, go to Tlalocan. Tlaloc, the god of water, is in charge of this realm and oversees the spirits. Finally, those who did not make it to any of the above heavens land in Miklan, the underworld. In this realm, the souls undergo nine trials to gain acceptance. The journey is arduous and the souls are guided by Shaloto, the evening star who once guided Quetzalcoatl through the realm. The first trial is to cross a deep river, the Apanawaya. After the crossing, the dead would be stripped of all clothes in preparation for the second trial, which requires them to pass through a tiny crevice between two mountains. This is the Tepetl Monamiklia Pass, where the spirit would make its way while being wary of the mountains colliding with each other. The third trial entails climbing over and crossing a mountain of sharp obsidian and flints called the Ilzeta Petal. The stones mercilessly cut and tear the flesh of the dead as they pass. In the fourth trial, the deceased would walk through Seluekayan the eight mountains that are covered with perpetual snow. Icy and bitter cold winds blow as the spirits cross this realm. The end of this trial marks the beginning of the fifth with no respite in the middle. The fifth trial leads the spirits across a vast, cold and desolate moor the Paniyekatakoyan, where the dead walk endlessly until they cross the land. In the sixth trial, the spirits would have to escape enemies who would constantly shoot arrows at them. This place is called Temiminaloyan. When they reach the seventh trial, they enter Tekoilinaoyan, a realm that is inhabited by thousands of fierce wild beasts that eat human hearts. Then in the eighth trial, the souls would be forced to dive into the river Apanuiayo, where the deceased would have to swim to cross to the next realm dodging the ferocious animals and reptiles of the dark and dirty river. Finally, they would have to wade through nine rivers on a path of mist and dark, called Izmitlan Apokkalolka. Thus, having completed the nine trials, the souls of the dead tired, injured, and exhausted with suffering, would reach Chikunamiktlan, where they would meet Miklantekutli, the lord of the underworld. Here, their journey would come to an end, their souls would end forever, and they would perish into eternal darkness. This whole journey lasts for four years, after which the deceased come to eternal rest. That concludes today's story. Please do subscribe to our podcast, leave a rating and a feedback. Your words shall only help in improving our content. The show notes are all in the links in the description. Follow us on social media to keep up with the latest. And please, do share our work with your friends and family. In the next episode, we will be trotting across the globe 
hearing the stories of the Altaic people of Central Asia, the Arente of Australia, and the Bashungo of Central Africa. Goodbye.